Welcome back. This is Ancient Philosophy, Lecture 6 on the Phaedo. Again, I'm Dr. Poston here at the University of Alabama. I'm enjoying working through this material with you guys. I've been enjoying your comments and your thoughts, so keep them coming. Uh, I love to get uh, feedback, and also um, I love to hear your ideas. So there is a lot going on in the Phaedo. As we talked about last time, the dramatic setting for the Phaedo is Socrates on the day he is going to drink. Hemlock is in jail. The uh, boat has returned that allows Athens to carry out its execution. Socrates' friends are all gathered together conversing with him, and they uh, discuss the nature of the soul on this occasion. So there are some really fascinating arguments in the Phaedo, some really cool ideas, and of course the uh, final scene is quite moving. So I will encourage you to pause and read that final scene for yourself. Think about what you uh, think about how you feel and, and sort of everything that is going on in that final scene with what has happened before. So let's jump right into the Phaedo. So the Phaedo starts out with a rather lengthy discussion on the nature of the soul, question of suicide, and so on. It begins with Socrates' wife, Xanthope, is there with at least some of Socrates' children, and they are they have sort of their final moments, and then uh, Xanthope is taken away by one of uh, Crito's uh, family members. And there proceeds a discussion of the nature of death, of suicide, and of Socrates' views about the soul and the body, and also philosophy. One passage that I want to highlight is how Socrates conceives of the goal of philosophy. So nowadays, if you study philosophy, most likely you study it in college for the first time. Philosophy is very much a professional enterprise where we learn how to reason, we learn how to formulate arguments, to evaluate arguments. We also learn a lot of content from the history of philosophy. So we learn about Plato and Socrates, we learn about Augustine and Aquinas, we learn about Descartes, about Leibniz, about Locke, about Berkeley, about Hume, about Kant. As you get into the 20th century, you study Russell, maybe A.J. Ayer, maybe you take a metaphysics course and learn about Chisholm, maybe you take an epistemology course and also learn about Chisholm. There's a lot to learn in philosophy as a professional field. But it's important to realize that for Socrates, the goal of philosophy is to live well. This is something that is accessible and he thinks obligatory for every person. So there's this passage that I want to highlight in 64a where he says one aim of those who practice philosophy in the proper manner is to practice for dying and death. As we see in the Phaedo, Socrates' idea here is that there is something unique about a person that reflects, that uses reason, that understands what can draw a person away from the enduring and the good. That person has a philosophical soul. And Socrates thinks that the goal, one of the goals, for those who practice philosophy is to practice the art of dying well. We're going to see how Socrates' own claims about the nature of the human person, about the nature of goodness, about the nature of reality, support him in his final journey. Now there's this other part in the introduction which introduces the forms, which we've talked about a little bit. So I want to go ahead and look at that. I want to read that passage and then comment a little bit about the forms. We're going to learn a lot more about the forms in this work, and then also as we turn to the Republic, we're going to learn more about Plato's views of the form. So I am going to pull up now the passage that I want to highlight from the Mino. So let's pull this up. Okay, so here we are. So 65b. So what about the acquisition of wisdom itself? Is the body an impediment or not if one recruits it as a partner in one's inquiry? I mean something like this. Do both sight and hearing offer people any truth? 
Are even the poets always telling us this sort of mantra that nothing we hear or see is accurate? And yet, if these particular bodily senses are not accurate or clear, then the others will hardly be, because I assume they are all inferior to them. Don't you think so? Certainly. So, Socrates continues, when, the, when does the soul grasp the truth? Because whenever it attempts to examine something together with the body, clearly at those times it is thoroughly deceived by the body. And so Socrates is wondering, all right, if the senses don't grasp truth, what grasps truth? And here he says, I'm going to scroll down for a bit. So here too, does the philosopher's soul particularly devalue the body and try to escape it, seeking instead to become alone by itself? And now Socrates, so after devaluing the senses, that the senses don't grasp you might say being or, or truth. He says, well, what about this, Simeus? Do we say that there is a just itself? Indeed we do, answers Simeus. Yes, and a beautiful and a good, of course. Now, have you ever seen with your eyes any of these things or of this kind? Or have you grasped them with one of the other senses that operate through the body? So Socrates here, remember, the Socratic quest is that he's after the nature of, of a thing. So he wants an account of piety. He wants an account of justice. He wants an account of goodness. These are, this account will illuminate something that in a way explains why particular things are good or just or pious. That something that all, right, pious acts have in common and in a way only pious acts have in common. So we, so we continue down, right? He said, that so wouldn't the man who did this most purely be one who so far as possible used his thought in its own right to access each reality neither adducing the evidence of his sight and thinking nor bringing any other sense at all with his reasoning but using thought alone by itself and unalloyed and so attempting to hunt down each real thing alone itself and unalloyed separated as far as possible from his eyes and his ears and virtually the entire body for, his reason, for the reason that the body disturbs his soul, and whenever it associates with it, doesn't let it acquire truth and wisdom. Okay, so let's pull back up our lecture slide here. So what we see in that passage is that Socrates is thinking that there's something that the mind can grasp that is enduring, explanatorily important, that in a way undergirds the perceived reality. These are the forms. The forms explain why particular things right, are an instance of those forms, why a good thing is good, why a beautiful thing is beautiful. But we will learn more about this as we go throughout the Phaedo and also in the Republic, but I want you to look at that particular uh, passage there to see, um, to note, you know, this is Plato's introduction to the form okay so let's move this move this over a little bit so the Phaedo really begins with Sieb's question on 70a let's look at this question so let's pull up the book again so here we are so when Socrates had said this Sieb's took up the conversation and said Socrates I approve of the other things you say but the matter of the soul causes people to have strong doubts and to worry that once separated from the body it no longer exists anywhere but is destroyed and perishes on the day when the human being dies and immediately as it is being separated from the body and that as it comes out is dissipated like breath or smoke flies away in all directions and isn't anything anywhere for if it really did exist somewhere alone by itself gathered together and separated from these evils you just described then there would be much hope, and a noble hope at that, Socrates, that what you say is true. But this very point doubtless requires no little reassurance and proof that the soul exists when the human being has died and has some power and wisdom. So what we see here is Socrates entertaining an objection from Sebes that says, look, you know, your speech about dualism, about, you know, death and the soul, it's all well and good, but this is a doubtful matter that the soul exists 
after the body dies, and we need some arguments. We need to be convinced. Now, you might be thinking, wow, this is a really interesting situation. Here are Socrates' friends right before he's going to die, and they're pressing him vigorously on whether or not the soul survives death. So put that to the side. Socrates, in usual philosophical fashion, entertains his friends and gives really interesting arguments. So the first argument is this argument from opposites. Now I'll let you read that description. It starts at 70, 70 E. Now it's important when you read something to try to figure out what's the conclusion and then try to figure out how does the reasoning go. And what we want to learn is this skill of reconstructing arguments. So as we read this passage, we see, we see a lot of discussion of how, you know, life comes from death, death comes from life, and so on. The big, right, comes from the small, the small comes from the big, and it's kind of sort of puzzling, you know, what's going on there. This is supposed to be an argument that the soul survives death, that the soul continues to exist after its death. And so we want to try to figure out how does this work? What is, what is Socrates thinking here? So what I have up there is my attempt to understand what's going on here, formulated in terms of an argument. So the way I see Socrates' reasoning here is very similar to the pre-Socratic puzzles about change in generation that we looked at in the first lecture. So the pre-Socratics were worried, how do, how do things change one thing into something that is its opposite? Right? And you have like Heraclitus, right, that says everything is in flux. You have Parmenides, says everything is one. And what Socrates here seems to be doing is like the way we can understand change and generation is that they come about from opposites. And it seems like we can interpret him as saying that opposites must have a seed to explain change. That, the, that is, there must be something within the opposite that enables it to grow into that which it's not. And so, if we're trying to put this in terms of a conclusion that may follow from this, Socrates reasons, okay, there must be in death a seed for life, and in life a seed for death. And so the thought is this somehow or another is supposed to make plausible the idea that when one dies, there's still right, the seed of life. Now, this argument doesn't seem compelling at all. It seems rather really poor argument. The next argument, I think, is much, much, much more improved. It's the argument from recollection. It harkens back to the Mino, right? So the argument here is that learning requires prior knowledge. Prior knowledge is impossible if the soul didn't exist before the body. This is what Plato seems to assume in the Mino. And so the soul must exist before the body. Now, this is an argument that uh, Semius and Sebes grant, and we'll return to this argument later on. Okay, so there's one more argument. This is the argument from affinity, and this argument I want to spend a little bit of time on. So, in response, remember, to Sebes' question about, well, does the soul survive death? Socrates gives these three arguments. We saw the argument from opposites, and then we saw just now the recollection argument. So, this, the third argument is the argument from affinity. Now, there's a bit of a pause. Simeon says, look, these, these arguments haven't shown that the soul exists after death. The first argument, the argument from opposites, we just think isn't very compelling, so we're not going to even think about that argument. The argument from recollection seems to show only that in order to explain how learning is possible, you have to appeal to prior knowledge. And so prior knowledge, Plato is thinking, requires the soul to exist prior to prior to being joined to a body. And Simeus correctly points out that that's all well and good, but that doesn't show us that the soul continues to exist after death. So we need a new argument. So Socrates starts to build this up, right? He appeals to some ideas. He says, well, when we think about the body, it's divisible. And then we think about the forms, right? They, they are uniform. They don't seem to have parts. So when we think about the beautiful itself, it's not as if it's a composite object that can be built up by parts. 
Now, when he's reasoning about the body being divisible, he's thinking about what kinds of things su are subject to decay and destruction. And he's thinking these are composite objects. So what's the body like? The body is like a composite object. It has various parts. And then we can understand how the body is subject to decay and eventually death because the parts start to not function well together. The parts start to sort of pull apart from one another. But things that are not like that, things that are single entities, that are uniform, are they subject to decay and death? Socrates seems to assume that no, they're not. It seems to think that at least it's more plausible right, to think that these uniform things are not subject to decay and death. So the forms are uniform, they don't have parts, they're eternal, they're unchanging, and so on. So with the forms here you can think about mathematical claims, these claims, you want to inspect a mathematical claim somehow or another to no longer be true, if it's true. It has a kind of existence that isn't within the realm of time and space. Socrates suggests the soul is invisible. Now here, I think it's best to take, take this in a really weak reading that Socrates is saying, look, we don't see the soul. Right, the soul has various powers and properties, which we'll talk about in a minute. Right, the soul can grasp truth. The soul is the receptacle, in a way, of experience. There's something it's like to be conscious, to listen to good music, to feel the cool breeze as you're sitting you know, outside on the quad on a beautiful day. So Socrates asks, is the soul more like a composite object or more like the forms that are uniform? And he argues that the soul is akin to the forms because it's not the kind of thing that has parts. I mean, we do talk about a divided soul, but that's purely metaphorical. I mean, it's not as if right, there are different parts that are somehow or another sort of put together. Right? The, the center of conscious experience seems to be a unified entity or a unified perspective. So now let's try to take these ideas and put them in terms of an argument that would convince us that the soul is eternal. Or maybe not convince us. This would be an argument that has premises, remember, that aim to support the conclusion that the soul is eternal. So Socrates reasons the soul grasp eternal and changing forms. That is, he's thinking that the soul can grasp the beautiful, the soul can grasp the just, the soul can grasp these claims, these true, these true claims about math and logic. Now this is a power that the soul has that doesn't seem to be a power of any changeable thing. Rocks and pebbles and dirt and so on, you, you can't build, you might, you might think of it in a more modern notion, it's like you can't build an entity that's able to grasp truth in the way that human, the human mind can. And so he reasons the soul, in virtue of having this power, is more akin to eternal things than perishing things. And this principle of affinity, right, that like things have like properties, right, would lead us to say that, okay, well, if the soul is akin to these eternal things, more, more akin to the forms, then it's going to have properties that the forms have. It's going to be single and unified, not subject to decay and death. So the soul, Socrates reasons, is eternal. So let's look here at how Socrates puts the point. So I'm on passage 79d. It says, but that whenever the soul considers alone by itself, it gets away into that which is pure, always in existence, and immortal and which stays in the same condition. That the soul, because it is akin to this, always comes to be with it whenever alone by itself and able to do so. That the soul is then at rest from its wandering, and in relation to those entities, stays always in the same condition, because the things it is grasping have the same kind of stability. And this state of the soul is called wisdom. So then... 
Siebes, his interlocutor, interlocutor at this point, moves to the conclusion of the passage, and he says, I think, Socrates, that from this approach, everyone, even the dullest learner, would grant that the soul is in every possible way more similar to what always stays in the same condition than to what does not. All right, so this is the argument from affinity. Now, this argument has some forms that can be, that are defended by contemporary philosophers. There's what's known as the argument from intentionality. This is the idea that the mind has a unique power not seen in the world, and that is the power to direct its states towards objects, to be about things in the world. We can, we have beliefs, we have desires, we can desire things that don't exist. How should we understand this power of the mind to be able to represent, to think, to have beliefs, to have desires? This is a really unique power. We can imagine states of the brain that can co-vary with states in the world, but those states in the brain don't have the right properties with the states in the world. This argument from intentionality has been developed by numerous people, and it's not really our purpose at this time to go into detail about this argument. I just want to point out that what Socrates is after here, this idea that the soul has a power that is unlike anything else in the world, is an idea that continues to receive a lot of philosophical attention and a lot of philosophical defense for that matter. So the affinity argument I think is really interesting. So let's move on. So before we get to the next, let's see if I can just minimize this or move this over, before we get to the next major part of Phaedo, I want to just look at how so Socrates is thinking about what philosophy does in the soul. So after this third argument, the argument from affinity, he takes several pages and he's talking about how philosophy works in the soul. And I would, would encourage you to go read these, read these aloud. So this is the conclusion. This is how the soul of a philosopher would reason. It would not think that while philosophy must free it, it should, while being freed, surrender itself to pleasures and pain and imprison itself again. The soul of the philosopher achieves a calm from such emotion. It follows reason and ever stays with it, contemplating the true, the divine, which is not the object of opinion. Nurtured by this, it believes that one should live in this manner as long as one is alive, and after death, arrive at what is akin and of the same kind and escape from human evils. Socrates remarks here, about the goal of philosophy will inspire a generation of philosophers known as the Stoics, who are writing centuries after Socrates in Rome. So for example, Seneca. Now, if you have time, I would encourage you to go check out Seneca's uh, discourses. They're wonderful to read, very encouraging. So Socrates here is thinking the life of a philosopher is more than just the investigation of truth that some way or other this kind of special philosophical life has practical consequences. It changes who you are. This is a picture that I think a lot of readers of Plato find compelling. So let's keep that in mind. Let's move forward to what I think is one of the more interesting objections that we find in Plato's works. So we turn here to Simeon's objection. I'm going to read the passage. We'll, we'll look at this passage. I think this is a really fascinating, fascinating idea. So let's look at what Simeon says here. So good, Simeon says. I'll tell you what puzzles me, and then I'm going to let Sibes talk later. He'll have his turn. Well, Socrates, I think, as perhaps you do too, that knowing the clear truth about things like this in our present life, about whether the soul that exists after death is either impossible or something extremely difficult. 
but that all the same, not testing from every angle what is said about them, refusing to give up until one is exhausted from carrying it out in every way, is the mark of an extremely feeble sort of man. Because concerning them, one ought surely to achieve one of the following. Either to learn or discover how things are, or if it is impossible, scroll down, if it is impossible to do that, at least to take the best human proposition, the hardest one to, dispro to disprove, and to ride on that as if one were taking one's chances on a raft, and to sail through life in that way, unless one could get through the journey with more safety and less precariousness on a more solid vehicle on some divine proposition. So he said, in the following respect, one might say the same thing about attunement too, and a liar in strings, that the attunement is something invisible, incorporeal, and utterly beautiful and divine in the tuned liar, whereas the liar itself and its strings are bodies, corporeal, composite, and earthly, and akin to the mortal. So what Simeus is saying here is he's saying, look, Socrates, you convinced us about these properties of the soul, that it's invisible, incorporeal, utterly beautiful, and divine. But we can make an analogy. We can say that the soul is like a harmony or an attunement. It's like that which is played on a musical instrument. The musical instrument itself is a body. It's corporeal. It's composite. It's earthly. Right? But look what he continues to say about this. So when someone either smashes the lyre or cuts and snaps its strings, what if one were to insist with the same argument as yours that attunement must still exist and not perished? Right, so here, here he's saying, this doesn't make sense, Socrates, because in the case of the lyre, if you destroy the instrument, the attunement, the harmony is destroyed. For there would be no way when the lyre still exists with its strings snapped and when the strings themselves, which are of a mortal kind, still exist, that the attunement, which is akin to and of the same structure as the divine and immortal, could have perished and perished before the mortal did. No, he'd say the attunement must still exist on its own somewhere. And the bits of wood and the string must rot away before anything happens to the attunement. In fact, Socrates, I think you yourself are well aware that we take the soul to be something of precisely this kind, since our body is made taut, so to speak, and held together by hot, cold, dry, wet, and certain other such things, and our soul is a blend, an attunement of those very things, when they are blended properly and proportionally with one another. Simeus is saying here, is he saying that your claim, Socrates, doesn't hold up to this alternative picture of the soul. If the soul is like a harmony that's played on a lyre, it can be invisible, incorporeal, beautiful. It can have the kind of properties, it's abstract in a way. But if the lyre is destroyed, the attunement, the harmony, will be destroyed. Similarly, when the body dies, the soul will fade away. So let's see how Socrates responds to this. This is, in a way, I think, the most compelling, philosophically compelling part of the Phaedo. Now, I should just note that Simmons's objection here tracks with a contemporary view of the mind, which stresses the distinction between hardware and software. So the software of a computer can be run on very many different machines, very different, very different, uh, a lot of different, you know, hardwares, we might say, right? So we can clearly distinguish between software and hardware, right? Microsoft Word is a program by Microsoft. It's software that can be run on a Mac. It can be run on a PC and so on. Right? And so in a way, what Simeus is saying is that the soul may, might be like software that's run on the machine right, of the brain. Okay, so let's turn to Socrates' reply to Simeus's objection. Now I should say, as you'll read, Siebes has a response as well to Socrates that he has this idea that soul's like a weaver. I mean, that clearly doesn't have the same philosophical merits as Simeus's objection. So I'm going to enlarge this just a bit. There we go. So there's a dramatic pause. Phaedo and Echecrates are at this point in the dialogue. You remember Phaedo is retelling right this uh, last day 
of Socrates to Echecrates and to other people gathered there. And they're both really puzzled at this point. They're like, wow, you know, I like Socrates' arguments. And then Simeon's objections seem like super powerful. And like, now what's going to happen? And, you know, they get into this space where they're thinking, all right, you know, philosophy is really difficult because we had a really good argument. And now we had a really good objection. So it's like harmony. And we're really puzzled. We don't know you know, what to make of this. And yet this is really pressing because Socrates is about to drink the hemlock and it really matters to him, but it also matters to us as friends, whether we think he's going to survive the death of his body. So Socrates talks for a while about the importance of reason. And there's this quote where he says, there is no greater evil one can suffer than to hate reasonable discourse. His advice there is don't be a misologue. Don't be someone that hates reason. And Ecrates and Phaedo sort of approach that a little bit because they're confused. right? And Socrates thinks, no, don't give up on reason. Continue to reason. Reasonable discourse is a great good. So here's how Socrates responds. So first, counterargument. So he says, look, guys, remember we talked about the theory of recollection. Like if learning is by recollection, then the soul exists before the body. Now, you think, yeah, that's right. Now, here's the really clever point. He says, if the soul is a harmony of a composite thing, being elements of the body in a state of tension, then the soul can't exist before the body, right? If the soul is a harmony, right, just like harmonies can't exist before the musical instruments, right, that play them, right? So the soul, if it's a harmony that depends on the body, can't exist prior to the body. So if he's right that learning is by recollection, then the soul is in harmony. Now, it's interesting. Both Simeon and Sebes are like, oh, wow, yeah, you're right, Socrates. That's really interesting. Now, there's this other argument that goes by really quickly that I want to highlight. So Socrates points out what we see him pointing out is that a harmony, like a song that's played on an instrument, the causal properties of that song are the properties of the instrument that are generating that song. So the sound waves, right, the, the, the loudness of it, right, are properties of the string, right? And when you fix the properties of the strings, right, how they're played, right, you're fixing the properties of the song. So there's a way of thinking that the song itself, the harmony itself, doesn't have any causal powers that aren't causal powers of the, the, the lower level right, instruments that's realizing those causal powers. But Socrates points out that the soul has causal powers. The soul right, is able to make decisions, right, to direct one of one's affairs, where these decisions, these intentions to direct one's affairs aren't right, somehow or another made by properties of the body, right? So there's this really clever argument. This is an argument that, again, contemporary philosophers discuss, some defend, some, some don't. But the argument is suggested here is that the soul has causal powers. A harmony doesn't have causal powers, so soul is in, is in harmony. So I just want to, I want to, want you guys to think about that. So let's move on here. So we get to the end of the dialogue. It's not really a dialogue, it's really a recounting of Socrates' last day. So we get to the end, and there is a lot going on here. We're not going to have time to cover it all, but I want to highlight a few things. So Socrates tells, in a way, his intellectual story. And I want to highlight just a part of that. So Socrates tells a story about how he's fascinated by Anaxagoras' philosophy. And Exagoras says the mind directs all things, and the mind is a cause of all things. And then he talks about how he became dissatisfied with Anaxagoras' philosophy worked out, because it turned out that the mind actually wasn't really directing all things, that it turned out that a lot that everything was explained in terms of mechanical causes. So let's look at this passage where this is sitting example, and let's think about that for a little bit. So let's pull up the Mino book again. So he says, but then, my friend, I was swept away from my marvelous expectations from an exaggerated philosophy. For as I went on reading it, I saw the man making no use of his intelligence and not laying any causes at 
its door with regard to ordering things, but assigning the causality to air, ether, water, and the like, as well as many other oddities. And I came to think that what had happened to him was exactly as if someone said that it is because of intelligence that Socrates does everything that he does. But then, when he undertook to give the causes of each of my actions, this person were to say first that the cause of my now sitting here is because my body is composed of bones and sinews. And whereas the bones are rigid and have joints separating them from one another, the sinews can tauten and relax, and they surround the bones together with the bits of flesh and the skin that keeps them together. Now while the bones are supported in their sockets and the sinews loosen and tauten, so presumably enable me to bend my limbs now, and on account of that cause, I'm bent here in the sitting position. Next, he'd give such causes with regard to my com conversing with you and assigning the causality to voices, airs and ears, and to countless other things, and would have neglected to give the real causes, namely that since the Athenians have decided that it was better to condemn me, and on account of that I too have decided that it is better to sit here, and more just to put and suffer whatever punishment they decree. So what is going on here is Socrates is saying that the mechanical implementations, you might say, of his decision to sit don't explain fully themselves why he is sitting. He's looking for a different kind of reason, the real reason why he is sitting. And that real reason right, has to do with something in his mind. It has to do with his intention, his beliefs, his reasons, right, to sit. And so he finds that Anaxagoras' philosophy, which starts off with the idea that Socrates is attracted to, that it's the mind that directs all things, turns out that all Anaxagoras does is cite mechanical explanations. And mechanical explanations, according to Socrates, don't get at the real reasons why things are the way they are. Now, what's interesting about this, so there are two aspects. One, this, is, I think, illustrates what we were talking about earlier, that there are these causal powers in the mind or in the soul, right? The soul has, these, has the ability to decide. And this is a really unique power that can't be reduced to processes that are going on in the body, right? It's not that, you know, somehow or another, the mechanical implementations in the body are the reason why. Socrates is sitting, right? The reason why Socrates is sitting, right, is because he wants to, right? It's his decision, right? That's the real reason. Now, the second reason this is an interesting example is because Socrates is interested in the real reasons things are the way they are. And for this, right, he thinks that you need to invoke the form. So let's look at this passage in 100. So Socrates continues here and he says, well then, I no longer understand those other wise causes and I can't recognize them either. Suppose someone tells me why something or other is beautiful and says that it is because it has a vivid color or shape or some other thing. I ignore those other explanations because I am confused when they are all around me and I keep the following at my side in my straightforward, amorish, and perhaps simple-minded way. Nothing makes it beautiful other than that beautiful's presence or association or whatever its mode and means of occurring may be. For I don't go so far as to insist on this, but only that it is because of the beautiful that all beautiful things are beautiful. Now, that, this is a crucial passage to think about Plato's theory of the forms because he's saying that it's because of the beautiful, it's on account of the form beautiful that all individual things that we count as beautiful are indeed beautiful, right? This is, you're supposed to think about this in a, in a way similar to the example we just talked about where the reason why Socrates is sitting is because he's decided to sit. And in some, some way, in a similar way, you know, the idea is that the reason why individual things, right, are counted as being beautiful is because they participate in beauty. This, he continues, for I think this is, safest to give this reply both to myself and to another, 
And I believe that if I cling to this, I could never fall, but that it is safe to reply both to myself and anyone else, that it is because of the beautiful that beautiful things come to be beautiful. All right. So that is in part Plato's early statement of the theories, the theory of the forms. The forms explain, they, they are the reason why individual, individual things participate or have this property, right? So why are individual things beautiful? Socrates thinks it's not, we can't give a mechanical explanation for that. We can't say this is beautiful because it came about this way. And we can't give a geometric explanation. We can't say this is beautiful because it has a shape. What we have to do, Socrates thinks, is we have to explain its beauty in virtue of the fact that it partakes in this abstract thing, beauty itself. Now, this is really puzzling for many people, myself included. All right, And so one of the goals that we may have is to try to give a philosophical reconstruction of Plato's doctrine of the forms. What we've said so far, right, is just in a way to illustrate our understanding of sort of how the account's supposed to work. There's supposed to be these abstract forms that are grasped by the mind that explain why individual things, right, or the things they are, why individual beautiful things are beautiful. Now, the Phaedo continues with uh, a cosmological story. I'll let you read that. And then the final scene, the final moving scene. Now, I'm not going to read this. I, I leave this to you to read. Let me know your reactions. I remember when I first read it, it was quite moving. And, and, and even now, I read it, it's still quite moving. All right, so next up, we are going to start the Republic. The Republic is the political masterpiece of Western society. It puts together sort of Plato's views of the human person, of ethics, and political philosophy. Really, really interesting book. And so we're going to have just, we're, we're going to really enjoy, we're going to take two weeks um, to study the Republic. Now, um, book one starts off with a character of Thrasymachus and his challenge of immoralism. And then book two gives the Ring of Gyges story, which is really interesting. So uh, you're going to have a treat again. Look forward to talking to you. Look forward to reading your papers on the Phaedo. So uh, email me if you have any questions. And um, I hope you guys are enjoying this, enjoying the readings. Um, so uh, take care, and I will see you next time.